In his book, The Kami Way, the scholar of Shinto Ono Sokyo wrote, Shinto is more than a religious faith. It is an amalgam of attitudes, ideas, and ways of doing things that have become an integral part of the way of the Japanese people. And I get what he's saying. One of the central tenets of religious literacy is understanding that religion is not simply a belief system. Religion also, to borrow Sokyo's words, is a way of doing things. Religion is implicated in how people behave, what they eat, who they hang out with, and how they structure their weekly and yearly schedules. And for many Japanese people, Shinto is an integral part of both personal and communal life. Many Japanese parents bring their children to a shrine at the ages of three, five, and seven as part of the rite of passage Shichi Go San. They might attend a shrine for New Year or maintain their own household shrine called a Kamidana. So it makes sense to me to call Shinto an amalgam of attitudes, ideas, and ways of doing things. But Sokyo's effort to define Shinto as more than a religion does raise the question, what, or rather, who decides that a religion is a religion in the first place? This might sound like a purely philosophical question, but if we take a look at some key moments in Shinto's modern history, from the mid-19th century to the present day, we'll see that Shinto's status as a religion fluctuated, and it continues to be a source of controversy with some serious consequences in modern Japanese politics. Let's start at the beginning, when the category of religion was first translated into Japanese. In 1853, the United States Commodore Matthew Perry sailed into Tokyo Bay, right outside the capital of the Shogunate the Tokugawa samurai clan's military government. He arrived with a demand that Japan open its borders to Western powers. However, Perry brought more with him than just a fleet of warships. According to the scholar Jason Josephson Storm, he also brought the problem of religion. At the time, the shogunate banned Christianity, and part of Perry's mission was to guarantee Americans' religious freedom in Japan. As a Western, mostly Protestant country, you shouldn't be surprised to hear that the American legal concept of religious freedom was very Western and very Protestant. Religion is personal private beliefs that should, at least ideally, abide by the separation of church and state that is to say, be separate from public life. This idea of religion was not in the Japanese lexicon. In fact, a lot of foreign concepts were not. Japanese translators increasingly needed to come up with new words to engage in diplomacy with the Western powers. Words like steamship, telegraph, and Western political concepts like republic and rights. And part of this translation process meant translating this Western concept of religion, which they translated as shukyo, which literally means sectarian teachings. While Japan obviously had traditions like Buddhism and Shinto, neither of them really fit neatly into this modern Western understanding of religion. For example, ritual practice was often emphasized over personal beliefs or shared doctrine, particularly in Shinto. And the separation of church and state wasn't really a consideration because both Buddhism and Shinto were active in the public sphere on a number of levels, as Japanese rulers officially patronized temples and shrines for centuries. But once religion became a critical concept for Japan's diplomatic relations with Western powers, the Japanese government needed to come to terms with religion. And I mean that literally. The Japanese government had to literally come to terms and decide what was and what was not religion. The threat of Western colonialism in the 19th and 20th centuries had an enormous ripple effect on Japanese politics and religion. We've mentioned the Meiji Restoration a few times now, but here it is again. People were not happy with how the Tokugawa shogunate was handling things, so a political revolution known as the Meiji Restoration fought to strengthen Japan by combining modern Western technology and government with traditional Japanese values. In fact, a Meiji slogan was, Japanese spirit and Western techniques. In 1868, the leaders of the Restoration succeeded in overthrowing the shogunate and soon instituted a constitutional monarchy. But what exactly does the Meiji Restoration have to do with Shinto and religion? Well, in practice, it meant reinstating the emperor as the head of a centralized state. 
which also included the reinvention of certain Shinto rituals and concepts as the basis for the emperor's divine right of rule. The category of religion was central to the Meiji and later administration's policies. For starters, as I mentioned in episode 2, one of the first things the Meiji government did was order the separation of Shinto and Buddhism. This led to a wave of violence against Buddhist temples and clergy, but it's important to remember that this was also really disruptive for many shrines, since it was mainstream to combine Shinto and Buddhist gods and rituals for over 1,000 years. The Meiji constitution also guaranteed Japanese citizens religious freedom. As Japanese religion scholar Julian Thomas explains, because Japan had formally separated religion from politics and constitutional law, Japanese people had to distinguish religion from not religion. The religion-not-religion -religion distinction established in Japanese constitutional law prompted ongoing anxiety about how to separate religion from other aspects of social and political life. Three categories were effectively created. Religion, non-religion, and superstition. Buddhism was categorized as a religion, a private faith and institution separated from the public sphere by force. Any folk traditions or new religious movements that didn't contribute to the state were either sidelined as religion or persecuted as superstition. For example, in 1935, the police demolished the headquarters of Omoto, a new religious movement derived from Shinto, and arrested many of their leaders for treason for venerating other kami over the emperor's ancestor, Amaterasu. The many existing Shinto traditions, on the other hand, were split into two groups, non-religious and religious, or state Shinto and sect Shinto. The formation of state Shinto started in the Meiji period, when the Japanese state officially co-opted the majority of shrines as sites for non-religious rituals on behalf of the emperor and the nation. Shrine property was seized, priests were required to become state employees, and hereditary priesthoods were abolished. Officials and academics argued that Shinto mythology, the divinity of the emperor, and the special status of Japan as a sacred land created by the kami were historical fact rather than a matter of personal belief. As a result, Japanese citizens and colonial subjects were expected to participate in state shrine rituals out of moral and patriotic duty, and over time, participation became practically mandatory. For example, every household was supposed to have a home altar with a talisman from the Grand Shrines of Issei, where the emperor's divine ancestor, Amaterasu, is venerated. Shinto mythology relating to the imperial line was incorporated into school history classes, and children were taught to bow to a picture of the emperor. Scholars continue to disagree whether to categorize these state-sponsored rituals as a national religion, or whether it actually formed a system of civic rituals like proponents claimed. In 1945, Japan surrendered to the Allied powers after the bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, and the United States immediately took the lead in reshaping the contours of government and religion in Japan once again. The occupation administration ignored the Meiji constitution and the distinction between civic and religious Shinto traditions, arguing that state Shinto was a source of militaristic ideology, a perversion of an ancient religion, and a dangerous mix of church and state. Through an order known as the Shinto Directive, state support of Shinto was totally abolished, and all Shinto shrines were legally categorized as private religious institutions. You can find the document fairly easily online, and parts of it read like wartime propaganda. It positions itself as liberating the Japanese people from direct or indirect compulsion to believe or profess to believe in a religion or cult officially designated by the state and later calls state Shinto a perversion of Shinto theory and beliefs into militaristic and ultra-nationalistic propaganda. Now, the Western powers, and especially the U.S., definitely considered state Shinto to be a national religion. Wartime propaganda warned Americans that the Japanese government had brainwashed their citizens into believing that the emperor was a god. Japan was a sacred land, and it was their god-given destiny to take over the world. Entrust to one man the powers of the President of the United States, the Prime Minister of Great Britain, the Premier of Soviet Russia. Add to them the powers of the Pope, the Archbishop of Canterbury, the head of the Russian Orthodox Church. Then top it all with the divine authority of our own Son of God. And you will begin to understand what Hirohito means to the Japanese. 
To be fair, they didn't invent these claims out of thin air, and the Japanese government ran similar propaganda campaigns against the US. But it's also important to remember that not all shrines, and definitely not all people, were happy with the state shrine administration, or convinced by its messaging. Remember that state Shinto was very disruptive for many shrines around the nation. Although state Shinto was abolished after less than a century, its formation forever changed the organization of many shrines. For example, in the pre-war period, Izumo Grand Shrine, which is basically on par with the Issei shrines in terms of significance and popularity, was designated a sectarian church, or Kyokai, while the similarly powerful Fushimi Inari Grand Shrine was incorporated into the state system. After World War II, the Association of Shinto Shrines, or Jinja Honcho, was created in order to manage the shrines formally under state Shinto, now collectively called Shrine Shinto. Today, Izumo Grand Shrine is affiliated with Jinja Honcho, but the Izumo sect remains part of the separate Association of Sectarian Shinto. And on the other hand, Fushimi Inari Grand Shrine is one of the relatively few large shrines capable to survive independently from both Jinja Honcho and sect Shinto. All of this demonstrates how much the past 100 years of history has affected religion in Japan. One of the tenets of religious literacy is understanding that religions change over time, and Shinto has experienced some major changes since the Meiji Restoration and World War II, which continues to affect Japanese politics to this day. One example is the Yasukuni Shrine. Yasukuni was created during the heyday of state-sponsored Shinto and has sparked controversies ever since. Emperor Meiji founded Yasukuni in 1869 to enshrine the spirits of those who had recently died during the Boshin Revolutionary War, a civil war between the Tokugawa shogunate and imperial forces, and partly the inspiration behind the 2003 movie The Last Samurai. The purpose of the Yasukuni Shrine was expanded over time to include casualties of several military conflicts. One of the major issues today is that it enshrines individuals who were convicted as Class A war criminals in the Tokyo trials after World War II. The big question is, when a government official visits Yasukuni to pay respect to the war dead, is it a violation of the separation of church and state, or a case of personal religious freedom? some might see their visit as a simple act of patriotism, but others might see it as support for right-wing political parties. For example, the Jinja Honcho's political wing, Shinto Seiji Renmei, explicitly seeks to return to an emperor and Shinto-centric government, according to their own website. Unsurprisingly, people disagree on the boundaries of religion and government in contemporary Japan. Many prime ministers have argued that they visit Yasukuni as private citizens, but such visits, which might alternatively be seen as glorifying Japan's imperial past, have strained relations with formerly colonized countries like China and Korea. For example, former Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe visited Yasukuni in 2013, which elicited official protests from Chinese diplomats both in Japan and in the United Nations. And in September 2020, only a few weeks after stepping down from the position as prime minister, Abe visited the shrine once again to inform the kami that he had resigned. The controversies around Shinto's historical status as a religion or a civic non-religion might seem far removed from our own experience. But studying the history of religion in other cultures help us think more deeply about where our own views on religion come from. Let's take the US for an example. I'm an American, and I've published a whole series on American civil religion. My country has its own fair share of rituals that blur a supposedly clear division between religious ritual and civic non-religious ritual, blur the lines between church and state. Is swearing an oath on a Bible or another sacred text religious? What about requiring children in school to salute the flag or pledge their allegiance to one nation under God? Americans can have a number of responses to these questions, and oftentimes very emotional responses to these questions. And ultimately, whether it's Japan or the United States, Shinto or Christianity, our definitions of religion continue to have a real impact on history, society, and politics. As always, thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time. Hey everyone, that was episode three of our five-part series on Shinto. I just want to say that this series is made possible because of our Patreon community. So back in January 2020, I announced to the channel that I really want to start posting longer series on world religions. I really want to start diversifying the topics on Religion for Breakfast. 
I have, you know, one too many videos on early Christianity because that's my own research field, and I wanted to focus on other religions, so Shinto, Buddhism, Confucianism, etc. Uh, so this series is the start of this new mission, and I would love to have the Patreon community decide what will be the next series. So I currently have a poll going on at patreon.com slash religion for breakfast, Confucianism or Buddhism. Okay, let's check. All right, Confucianism is currently winning at 61 votes versus 51 votes for Buddhism. So if you want Buddhism to win, you have a few votes to make up. Uh, you can head on over to patreon.com slash religion for breakfast. Everybody at the $2 level and above can vote on the poll. Um, but again, thank you everyone in the Patreon community. Your contributions help keep this channel going. And I hope to see you all next time with either Confucianism 101 or Buddhism 101. Thanks everyone.